We're going to consider how independence the local government can be best secured <coughs> and what the main barriers are to that happening. And what, if anything, do both central government and local bodies stand to gain from increased decentralization? Above all, how would that help to revive the local politics and citizen participation? And not forgetting that this all takes place against the backdrop of vicious public sector budget cuts, um, which have been felt particularly acutely. But let's start by thinking. Jane, thank you very much. Um, I've got two passions in my political life. One is to make our country more democratic, and the other is to help babies, children, and young people realise their full potential by early intervention. And I've written two reports for HMG. Uh, they've come together in the last couple of days. Although I'm known as Mr. All Party because I try and get Liberals, Conservatives, as well as Labour working together on particularly on the intervention issue. That coalition of forces has been strained in recent times, the last few days, because we've discovered one and a half billion pounds being taken out of the early intervention grant that local authorities spend on family intervention projects, uh, family nurse partnership. Sure starts. That has just been taken away by a decision that I'm sure you're all familiar and have read the document, um, technical guidance on RSG slash um, business rate on page 140. And just Sir Humphrey has managed to take out one and a half billion pounds of your spending in your local areas. And for me, this underlines why local government has got to get off its knees and claim its right to be independent of the centre. We have the most over-centralised uh, bureaucracy, if you like, in any Western democracy. And no other Western democracy puts up with its local government being a vassal and a slave in the way that we do. So all I'm asking is that we stop this weird situation. We're the odd people out. You go to America or Canada, or France, or Italy, or Germany, or any Western democracy. <coughs> and those people take it for granted. Sometimes it's written in a written constitution that local government is not a creature of central government. It is separate, it is independent, but of course acts in partnership. So that is the standard. That is the democratic standard. And we don't have that in England. Now, We've actually come to the conclusion that the time is auspicious for us to stop being a sleeping giant and actually throw off the chains. A number of things are happening at the moment that make that even more pertinent. Firstly, what's happening in Scotland? What are you going to do in your English local authorities? We've solved, to an extent, the Scottish, Welsh and Northern Irish questions. We have an English question now. The English question is, if we devolve authority to the nations of the United Kingdom, what do we do? Who speaks for England? What do we do in terms of devolving power in England? Since we made such a hash of regionalism uh, when Labour were in power and failed to do it at the same time as Wales and Scotland, that's a dead letter for now, whether we like it or not. So the only institution that can seize this agenda right now, and it ties into independence for local government, is local government. The so local government have an opportunity. As this issue comes up the agenda, with the debate that's going to happen around a referendum in Scotland, Devo Max for English local authorities <coughs> will become <coughs> And you need to seize it. Not wait for someone else to try and you know, offer it to you. That will never happen. We're talking about political power here. No one gives away political power. You need to have the confidence to say, we are just as good in England at running our local authorities as anyone in America or Italy or anywhere else in the democratic world. We can do it, get off our backs, and then perhaps you'll be in a situation <coughs> where people don't take a billion and a half pounds out of your budget without you even knowing. I've had a dozen local authorities email me in the last 48 hours saying, where the hell did this come from? And why should you know when these things are done in a hole in the wall way? If you're free, you're raising your own money, 
you have your own powers, all the things that are in the code that we've issued, then you'll be able to find your own way and you'll be able to make sure that you do things in a sensitive, accurate, capable way in your locality. That you don't need to ask the Secretary of State for transport if you can have permission to put a double yellow line on the high street anymore. But we can do these things ourselves better than they can do in Whitehall. So, I'm the chair of the Select Committee on Political and Constitutional Reform, the Keep an Eye on Nick Clegg Committee, as it's sometimes called. <laughs> um, on our agenda, we've had the AV referendum and we've had parliamentary boundaries with reform of the House of Lords. Uh, we're doing something at the moment on reshuffles. I'm just off to Scotland this afternoon to do something about the need for a, a constitutional convention post uh, or prior to the referendum. Lots of issues, but one of the key ones for us is issuing a code, a draft code, about how a new relationship could work. Not a concordat, not a bit of paper, not a Euro directive, not a please would you, but something in statute which separates local government from central government and in addition, and perhaps Colin will say a little bit more about this later, hides our independence behind the wall of the 1911 Parliament Act which says the Second Chamber can't veto anything apart from the right of the First Chamber to extend its own life. And then secondly, I'd like it to say can also veto if the <coughs> First Chamber or the government seek to remove or erode the rights of independent local government. That would be so strong it would never be challenged. We've never had a challenge on the, on the first one about extending the life of the Parliament. So we put a lot of thought into this. Key development has been that we've worked hand in glove with the LGA. And I must say this in, in a public forum, that the leadership at political and officer level in the LGA has been absolutely first class. Talk about sleeping giants. If the LGA ever gets its act together as it looks like it's doing now, then we're really cooking. But together in an unprecedented collaboration, the Select Committee, my Select Committee and the LGA have worked together hand in glove. I've done tours, I'm sure there's some new faces uh, in the audience that we've seen and uh, Keith kindly invited us to address uh, the, the Yorkshire region local authorities. I've been just about everywhere, Sir Merrick Cuckell and myself and a number of other colleagues, Colin and others, and Keith done his own stuff and a number of people in the audience, raising this issue of, okay, They've done a nice little code, what's wrong with it, how do we improve it? And trying to get people to put in advice, evidence and consultations about how it might look. I would ask you all, even if you think I'm talking tripe, write in some evidence to say that. Or if you think we might have an inkling of something here, then please put in a paragraph to the Select Committee. It will add strength to what we're trying to do. So, we've moved that forward. Consultations underway. It nominally closed on October the 5th, but the great thing about being the chair of the select committee is I can say <laughs> that it's open again and it's open until, until you guys have all put your uh, little address in and we'd like to do that. Uh, if you need, if you've got your pen and paper handy, I'm going to give you my email address. Just drop me an email and say, What the hell are you talking about? What have we got to do? It is Alan GW, A W -L, L E N. <coughs> at parliament.uk. So just pop me an email, I will send you the consultation note, and if you want to respond to that, I'd be most grateful. The other thing is, this is very strongly all party. My select committee is indeed dominated by coalition members of parliament. The LGA is a broad representative body, including everyone. I've been to the uh, LGA executive board and spoken, and there's been great support across all parties. We've had the rhetoric of localism, and this, rather like Scotland, is another factor at the moment. The rhetoric of uh, localism can now be taken that step further. What is next after localism? What is next is us demanding our independence, to run our own affairs effectively. I say us, I've been a councillor, and I've been a, a senior officer in a council. I'll tell you where I was most powerful afterwards if you want to know. <laughs> so, we are at this point 
Thank you. Jane, where there's an opportunity where we can actually do something serious. And the final factor, just to throw in, is that we now have, people sometimes don't realise this, a fixed term parliament for five years. So we're about halfway through. I think that's a really good thing because it allows you to plan. You're not paralysed by speculation over the last couple of years about when an election is going to be. It gives you the possibility to plan something. So we can push this thing forward. We want to obviously to have something in manifestos. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we had some the same words in three party manifestos? But let's be even more ambitious than that. We could I understand there's a concept around called the midterm refresh, whether they're going to do it as a midterm refresh or something else. But clearly, as, you, as you're halfway through a parliament, uh, the government will want to do something serious. So why don't we get into that agreement? Can we get the words <coughs> local government into that agreement? Can we get the words take localism further? Can we get the words look at independence to bring us up to democratic standard in the Western world. I think there's an opportunity there. And so Mary Cockell and myself are going to see both the Deputy Prime Minister and the Secretary of State for Communities and Local Government to make our pitch with our evidence, with our effort on an all-party basis, with this drive to say who speaks for England, with the effort about Devo Max in England on the back of what may happen in Scotland, on the back of all the pressure that we want to bring to bear to run our own affairs so that we're not at the mercy of decisions from Sir Humphrey or anybody else in Whitehall. Politicians always say, yeah, this is a great moment. Well, I hope I've convinced you that there are some key factors at play which indeed do make this a key moment. But you will never get freedom as a slave unless you yourself are determined to seize that opportunity and break out and look after yourselves. That is exciting. As I know, I was the only member of parliament ever to have run a local strategic partnership in a big city. I know the quality that we have, not just in our council, but in our local health <coughs> service, in local policing, in the voluntary sector. In business. We don't use these people. We make great people who bring their commitment to the public service, we make them risk averse, we make them cautious, we tie them up, we say don't do anything till you get something come down the pipe from Whitehall. Let's free that capability, not only for what we can do for people in our area, but to actually rebuild local economies get growth back into the economy. All that capability which is currently frozen and bottled up because we happen to be, as England, the last country in the empire being ruled from Whitehall, let's free that capability and do some fantastic things for our community. The things that all of you who are councillors joined to do. And if we do that, I think we'll have made a fantastic step forward. But, I'm not going to do that for you. You're going to have to help. You're going to have to say this what you want. You're going to have to write in a little bit of evidence, one paragraph, to me at alangw.parliament.uk. If you can't be bothered to do that, you don't deserve your own independence. Thank you. <laughs> Speaking as the leader of the Slave Party in uh, Leeds, uh, we've got a, a group from Leeds coming over. I think it's very easy um, to get, when you're talking about the cuts for the next four, five, six, seven years, depending on your perspective, working in local government, <coughs> you can get very depressed about the opportunities of local government in the future. And that's why I very much welcome Graham's work, because what Graham's work on the Select Committee has done 
is raise the profile, raise the aspirations, raise the status, and I think raise the opportunities for people practicing in local government. And in many ways, you know, it's not about going home and waiting for the end of the world and playing Leonard Cohen music. It is about having a bit more optimism about the future as a local member. Because if you look around many groups or many councils, We've got a whole swathe of new young people with aspirations, visions and hopes. And that's the thing we, certainly in the Labour Party, need to continue to nurture and grow. Now, uh, one of the reasons why I agreed to chair the Local Government Commission, or the Commission Local Government in the future, was because I thought this was an opportunity to, again, talk optimistically about the potential of local government. And the LGA have supported, and the Select Committee, I think, Graham, you were there at the House of Lords when they mm -hmm. launched this, have been extremely supportive. And let me go through, I think, two or three major propositions of the Commission that I think will help the debate and discussion this afternoon. The first thing, you often get, uh, I've been a member for about 25 years, and the leader of the group for 10, and you often do get battered into assimilation of a culture that thinks local government is now at the end game. And our job is to reverse that culture into a much more optimistic one. And um, uh, one of the things that surprised me, we did have people like Will Hutton, Tim Brighouse, Joe Williams from the Quality Care Commission, uh, Lord Victor Adebowale, other people from the private sector, Tony Travers, some very powerful voices on this commission. And as an elected member, I found it really inspiring to listen to people like that with their vast experience talk about elected members being the voice of the people. Because in a day and age when you are facing cuts of a huge scale, I mean £90 million for the first year for Leeds City Council alone, I know other colleagues are probably sharing that as well. When you're facing cuts and when you're facing the fragmentation of public services, as with academies, as with the police, as with other things, you start to look at the role of an elected member in a different way. And our job is to try and extend our democratic mandate in local government, and not just around the provision. So I think uh, that voice about that comment made by the Commission from non councils of being the voice of uh, people is very powerful for local government. But the two or three propositions that I thought we were focusing on was one, Graham's already touched upon this, there is now a growing crisis in this country about devolution. Uh, I think Graham's touched upon it. You look at Wales, Northern Ireland and Scotland, they have successfully made a, their own contribution, their own distinct contribution to local government with their own ideas. The, the lesson for me about the fragmentation of local government in this country was actually negoti negotiating the city region deal. Because we had 10 departments to talk to about how we could devolve powers to local government. Now that isn't coherent. If you look at Northern Ireland, you have a minister, you have one door. Scotland and Wales the same. One door for government. We have 10 doors. We had to go through 10 doors before we could secure a deal. And I'm not of a pessimistic nature, but I cannot see regionalism coming back in the next five years or so. I think that one is part somewhere, maybe in the future, when times change. I also don't see uh, regional development agencies making a comeback. Um, and you can have mixed views about that. I think they suffer from a democratic deficit, but I think some of the work in some of the parts of the country were very good. But there were local government powers which they assumed some time ago. So I think the city-region deal and local government being at the centre of that is the first start to answer the devolution crisis we've got in this country. The other thing, and I, I, again, I was talking to colleague here about local government and some of the history and I don't want to sound as if I'm looking through nostalgic glasses but <coughs> local government has played a huge part in civic enterprise in this country. Now civic enterprise is a concept which came out of the commission 
And often people think civic enterprise, that's kind of right wing, isn't it? But if you look at the history of local government, local government has managed to shape all our big northern great cities, be it Manchester, be it Liverpool, be it Leeds, be it Birmingham or so on. You look at the history in the 19th century and local government was very much at the forefront of that. And I think the question for all of us is, can it still play that role? Having years of managerialism, having years of control, can it unleash the shackles and allow people's talents, which do exist, Graham, absolutely right, with offices and members, to shape their own economies and communities? And I believe they can. And I'll give you an example. The 19th century local government is about um, water, education, public health, and all the things, transport, gas, utilities, and so on. That, those utilities are there in the 21st century that local government can lead. They're called low carbon, they're called broadband, they're called fuel poverty, they're called neighborhood network to support elderly. And I think local government should be given that role to actually start leading the 21st century utilities, particularly when my genuine belief about local government is there to address inequality. It's there to bring communities together and make sure it's not divided by inequality of opportunity and wealth. And I think that role of leading utilities is one that local government should play. If I had a dream, that would be it. There are other propositions that I think I haven't got time to finish, but I'll talk on one because it's the elephants in the room that nobody talks about. One of the good things about select committees is they shine a light on the over-centralised nature of this country in local government. And the statistic that keeps coming back is 91% of the spending in local government is controlled by Whitehall. What other country, except for Malta, I think, Graham, is quoted in the select committee's report, has such a centralised grip of finance? And I think that's the thing that local government freedom needs. You look at Denmark, where there's a mature partnership between local government and central government. They raise 40% of their own funds. You look at Sweden, both very successful economies, and you can see local government is treated with respect. And it's treated as an equal partner with ability. And I think that's the issue, that unless we can address then we won't be getting the freedom. Constitutional freedom is one thing, but we all need resources to carry out those responsibilities and aspirations that we have. And I, I, I just say one thing, because it's a comment on today's financial arrangements. We were told that we could uh, grow our own uh, business rates, keep them, and have autonomy in finance. As everybody knows, that is not the deal we've got. We've now got even more control, even over the business rates <coughs> and the grants than we've ever had. We are not free to generate our own income and decide on priorities and so on. And that's a long, complicated argument, but you look at the things and what we're now seeing is a fundamental shift between local government being rewarded on needs or finance on needs to local government being financed by strong market forces. And one example for those in housing, if you've got an interest, new homes bonus, great if you're growing, great if you're a successful strong city. Where are those successful strong cities in the southeast? And I think uh, some of us in the north, even though Leeds is a very strong economy, is a very successful city, will start to suffer from the recent uh, change in funding that is moving to what I would call a free market position. So the freedom of local government for me uh, is one that I think Graham is, has already articulated, is an extremely important one for all of us, and also really one that I think will store some of the faith that some of us have in local government to actually not only shape our cities for the future, but actually also to look over our own uh, vulnerable people in our own community. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you very much for <coughs> inviting me to, to this event. Um, I've also been, like uh, Graham, both a, a councillor and a senior officer, so I do know the answer to the question <laughs> uh, about where the power in local government uh, really lies. Um, I also wanted to start off by saying, I don't want to make this sound too much like a sort of loving almost, but I think the consultation that Graham's committee has done on this code um, should be taken as a model for consultation, not just across the select committees of parliament, but also for government itself. As a member, I remember so many times receiving consultation documents from the government, I'm sure you still are, please reply within three days or 20 minutes or whatever the uh, uh, ridiculously short length of time um, uh, you've been given. But what Graham has done with this committee, I think, is, is highly commendable in the length of time um, that has been allowed for the consultation around the code and also um, for the activity that he and others have put in at events like this to stimulate interest uh, around the code and around the whole concept of independence for local government. So I think you know, it's a testament to your committee and what you've uh, been doing, Graham, and I hope the responses are, and I'm looking forward to seeing the responses, actually. I hope they are uh, uh, many and many and varied. One of the things I was going to um, sort of emphasise today, I think, and, it, and it's interesting listening to the speakers so far, um, one of the sort of ways I describe local government in this country is actually it's neither local nor government. Um, we stick to using that term, but both of them, in the realities of what they mean, um, are, are often meaningless. Uh, we have some of the biggest units of local government across Europe. We have uh, huge populations within our councils. Um, we have councils that actually are meaningless to their residents because they're made up places. The boundaries don't mean anything. The names, and I, I was a former member in Newham Council, which you know, as much as Robin Wells will disagree with me, Newham doesn't exist. You know, it's not a place. It's East Ham and West Ham and Silvertown and Canning Town and Woolwich and all the rest of it. And Plasto and Upton Park. Of course Upton Park, shouldn't forget that. Um, uh, 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 but it's not actually a genuine place. And then when you look to the issue of government, we see that our councils aren't really government. They're not able to control uh, what goes on within their area. They're not independent political units with freedoms and protections and responsibilities <coughs> of their own. They are creatures of statute. You know this. Everything that local... And, and I, I you know, put to one side at the moment the, uh, uh, the new uh, general power of confidence. Why it's general power and not power of general, I, I remain to um, find out, but I'm sure there is a reason for that. Um, they are creatures of statute. I also think that this new power will probably end up in court somewhere. I sense a test case coming. I don't know if any of your councils will be brave enough to be the, uh, the leader of the charge in that test case. But I can't see, uh, I can't see the courts in this country giving up on ultraviaries like me. Now, I can see a judge in some uh, wig and gown somewhere saying, ah, oh, when Parliament said that councils are really people and really individuals, it didn't actually mean that they're really people. And what it actually meant is that the courts can still have supervisory powers over what local government... You know, call me a cynic if you like, but, but being involved in local government 30 years can often do that to you, I think. So I wait to see um, that. So we don't have uh, uh, powers... Of, of, we don't have independent protection for local government. And the question was asked at the very beginning, what are the barriers to independent local government? I think there are many, but I'll summarise them, I think, by saying, I think they're political, they're legal, they're constitutional, they're cultural, and of course they are financial. And there are a few that I've, I've probably missed off as well, but I think those particular features of our local go government system are what um, uh, prevents it from playing a really uh, independent role. I think the work that is trying to be, um, that has been done around this code um, is focusing on uh, that constitutional <coughs> issue. One of the things that local government in England doesn't have is the constitutional right to exist. You know? Now, without that right to exist, you are nothing. You know? And we know that central government can and does shape the boundaries, the powers and responsibilities, the processes, the procedures, uh, the functions of local government. It tells you what you do and it also tells councillors how they can do it as well. Um, uh, I often wonder, you know, I, I, it's, it's an honour to actually sit next to people who are still councillors because, you know, I, I, I often think to myself, I would rather do anything else today 
to be an elected member with the sorts of things that our councillors and our councils have to struggle. So good luck to you and, and anybody else who are, who are still members. The key thing then, I think Graham emphasised it um, earlier, the key thing for local government is that issue of constitutional um, uh, protection. Now, in my mind, the best way to, uh, to secure that is a written constitution that sets out the powers and responsibilities of the centre and the localities. A Magna Carta, if you like. Um, I just can't remember what that stands for. <laughs> I'm sure somebody will tell me in, in, in a moment. Um, a Magna Carta, again, uh, for local government that gives real constitutional protection. Without that, the next best thing is this constitutional enshrinement of the code or a version of it that the, the Graham's committee is, is consulting on. Um, and enshrining that in law, using something like the 1911 Parliament Act, to make sure that that code cannot be changed or altered by any incoming government, and that might well be one of our, our government as well, let's be honest. Because um, the one truism we all know in local government is oppositions promise freedom, governments deny. And I have to be honest, our governments in the past have denied us freedom in local government as much as Conservative and now Conservative and Liberal Democrat government have. We have to crack that cultural aspect if we're to move on constitutionally. Central government, parties nationally have to trust councillors and local government to be able to get on with their jobs and effectively, not wishing to sound too Churchillian, give them the tools to get on with that job and that job, um, sorry, those tools are, are, are constitutional protection and a way of ensuring through this, through the 1911 Act or indeed any other statute um, that that code cannot be changed and it cannot be, uh, sorry, not changed without a constitutional procedure and it cannot be changed without the views of local government being very heavily discussed at, at, at the table. The other, there's a couple of other aspects I want to touch on very quickly, and that uh, uh, the first is the the, uh, the the cultural. I've been involved in um, uh, an awful lot of academic research uh, amongst councillors. Some of you may well have completed questionnaires for me, and if you have, thank you very much. Uh, and if you did receive um, questionnaires and didn't complete them, then shame on you. You're holding back the boundaries of knowledge, and I think you should uh, you know, just, just think about that. Um, uh, but one of the issues that's come up often is that uh, uh, councils are reluctant, that might sound like a surprise, councils and councils are often reluctant to take on what I might call new political powers. There is a real cultural barrier messages that are coming from councils about a reluctance to take on new powers. So I think we need to sort of throw off the shackles um, of, uh, uh, of Whitehall. Because I suspect that that view has emerged <coughs> over the years because of the way in which uh, central government has always treated local government. So we need a radical cultural change. And that cultural change has to also um, come centrally as well, of politicians at the central level. We will not get independent local government unless the centre permanently sees some influence and some power. Uh, so I think there's a big cultural question we have to deal with. And the final aspect I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick on is financial. Without your own um, a stream of income, without the ability to raise taxes and to spend, and to have a regime of tax powers that go beyond anything that we experience at the moment, local government will always be hidebound. Uh, if it is unable to tax and spend efficiently and effectively. And of course, you may well elect councils that don't want to tax and don't want to spend. Well, that's okay too, because that's what independent local government is about. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions at this point for Graham, just specifically on, on, on the work that he's doing? I think, and then we'll part of that. So, any any particular aspects of of the consultation or the, the work that the committee is doing that you want Graham to elucidate? It's not a question. It's a more of a point, if that's okay. I'm with uh, Councillor Ellen Cruz uh, from Birmingham City Council. Um, and obviously the big local authority in Europe, Debo Max is something that I'm passionate about as a new council, so I'm really, really pleased that uh, the committee is undertaking this work, my work, sorry, and I'm looking for the consultation and emailing 
we're monitoring all the answers. There, there, <laughs> there are people in the room who have already asked for and have been received. Well, well, the Chinese yeah. Minister as well has come out policy here. So I'm really, really pleased about that. Because we do need to break the shackles of central government. Birmingham is a huge authority, and currently it's not fit for purpose because you have the powers that it needs, and it hasn't got the, the financial power that it needs. And if we can have tax raising power, and to an extent, through the city deals, we've got certain things that can do with business rights, but it's not enough. It's not enough. Okay, so I'll take that one, Jane. Very quickly, yeah. Um, yeah. Finance is a really interesting question, and I probably need at least an hour to explain it. <laughs> as uh, we all know how difficult it can be. We proposed, and it's not, you know, take it or leave it, but we proposed what we think is a quite simple way forward. No change in the level of income tax. No change in the way we equalise, because we're still going to look after people. No change in the officials, the individuals who do all that work on the seventh floor of Eagle House that declog the Department of Local and whatever log, log is. Yeah. Um, so, minimum frightening of the horses to start off with. Now, how do you do that? Right, we all pay income tax. It just happens that roughly, and there's better figures in the document we've done, but at least for the sake of the argument, roughly half of your income tax take actually ends up back at the local authorities. Councils spend it for all the things that they should do and all the services they provide. So, what happens right now? You pay your tax, your income tax, it's collected by Inland Revenue, HMRC, goes up to there, to HMRC, and then goes entirely up to the Chancellor of the Exchequer, who distributes it to lots of different departments, and then a little soft rain filters back down. Some bit dry rain, in fact, we're finding out, not comes back down to the local authorities. So you've got this, you know, very complex bit of stuff and it comes back. Why don't people understand what's going on in the locality? There's no transparency of the funding. So, that proposal. Change it, please. So this is what we've put on the table. Income tax is collected exactly the same rates. No one can vary the rates. Goes straight up to HMRC. Fine. Everything's as it was. Half of it goes off to the Chancellor of the Exchequer. The other half goes to the boffins on the seventh floor in England House. Somebody else is responsible for them, like an independent commission or whatever. And I would suggest personally that that's made up of local authority leaders of all parties. Woe betide anybody who starts to muck about with that formula because you'll spoil the party for everybody else. And actually, I don't need to threaten anyone in local government. If I look at prudence in our society, most local authorities are AAA rated and are great people to invest your money with. Can the central government say that? So let's just be careful who stops lecturing who about whether people are capable of looking after themselves or not and they'll do everything for them. You ain't got a great record in my world when you're not looking for the two. So, off to these people in Eland House, then using the same formula of distribution and equalisation back to the, lo the localities with one bound, without changing a single thing, without threatening raising the rates or anything else, the circle is very evident to people. You could even have on your wage slip, the income tax to the centre is X, the income tax to your local government. You don't need to buy in people to create a new bureaucracy, you're just using the, the HMRC people. You will not have the power to change the rate, but all of a sudden your base budget will be paid for very directly by your own electors. And part of independence is that on top of that, you can then raise whatever money you want if you can justify it to your electorate. If it wanted a hotel tax, if we wanted to do a poll tax, God forbid, in Nottingham, if we wanted to do a singing and dancing tax in Boris Johnson's uh, New London. Whatever you wanted to do, if you could get it by your electors, and that means you've got to involve them, talk to them, but you know what, all of a sudden, if you're running your own local authority, what Colin said, I have to say, Colin, I'm sorry, I have to agree with you. I don't know if I started my life again that I would want to be a councillor at the age of 22, 23 as I was, because 
I don't want to do someone else's dirty work, frankly. If I can inspire people locally, if I can get an elderly person's uh, ward native complex built, as I did, as one of the great achievements of my life when I was 23, because I, we built that up in the localities you could do in those days. If you can serve your community and you're concerned about environment or planning, or, and you can make a real difference, all of a sudden, lots of people are going to start joining political parties. They're going to see the local authority as relevant, as responsible, as being held to account. So I think that's the answer on finance. Don't change the fundamentals, but change the line of account so that people really start to feel they own local government. Thank you very much. So, putting us back on, Philip. Well, what I'd like I, to add to everything that everybody said, which I don't want to gain say, is some additional benefits that I think could accrue to local authorities. And that is if you disaggregate in the way that Graham's talking about, what you actually do is you begin to create the financial infrastructure for the type of um, new settlement that we need. One of the most striking things, I think, about our current economic crisis is that if you notice what the Bank of England's been doing and what the Chancellor's been doing, is keeping replacing the engine, uh, because the engine isn't delivering credit cap and capital to small and medium-sized businesses and to our localities. But the problem in our centralised financial infrastructure isn't the heart, isn't the pumping mechanism, it's the circulatory system. If I can extend the metaphor, it's the veins that have collapsed. And one of the reasons none of these government initiatives to uh, create financing and push money out to the localities don't work is, quite simply, there are no mediated institutions. There's no institutions out there that actually are designed and designated to lend. And one, I think, one thing I think of the added benefits of the type of constitutional settlement that, that people are calling for is it will actually demand and require a new form of localised infrastructure. And if the disaggregation of income tax that, um, that uh, Graham is talking about happens, what you will then have is defined and definitive income streams coming into, government, uh, into local government. And if local government can truly innovate around its tax bases and do anything from car parking charges to you know, anything to development charges, these can actually function as the basis for a new form of infrastructure. At Res Publica, uh, the last report we published just uh, before the summer recess was on community bonds. And we argued that actually the way to allow uh, small and intermediate projects to take place and, and go to scale was give local authorities the power to couple, if you like, any form of local tax raising power, any form of income, to a universal bond structure, which could, could then go to open market. So in principle, you could form any project, provided you could disaggregate and separate an income stream. And actually, this form of intermediate bond structure would be precisely what's needed to get the economy going again, because all of the measures the government are currently announcing actually won't even kick in by the time of the next election. And I think it's exactly this renaissance of local financial and capital infrastructure that actually is almost the only way we can start to rebuild the great city-states of the north and indeed to help create the growing uh, city-states we want in the south. And so, so what I think the merits of this, I think, are are often in the type of <coughs> variation that is, is brought about. Now if I talk to ministers or secretaries of state, and I have on this proposal, they're not so, uh, how can we put it, positive. And the reason they're not positive is to say, look, the power of competence does all this. I, I, we don't understand uh, why and what else is required or is, or is needed. And then if you talk to the Treasury, that I have done, um, they then say, well, God, the immediate reaction, which is very interesting, is we need to control local expenditure. And if we don't control local expenditure, somehow it will go out of control. So if I was running a political campaign for these proposals, which I'm not, but if I was, I would make two types of points. The first type of point I'd want to make is that actually, if you, if you chart local government expenditure, 
against central government expenditure, you'll see that local government expenditure hardly ever hits deficit, is in surplus, and actually is very solid indeed. And that's because it follows a sound economic principle, that if you want to save money, you make sure the expenditure and raising of it is as close to the point of expenditure and raising as possible. It's central government, because it is so far away, that can't assess its liabilities, can't assess its needs, and can't manage its expenditure. And even ministers are slightly unaware of the infrastructure governing bond investment and bond issuance. They don't really understand it, which is interesting. And they think the public sector works for this as an item of control, which of course it isn't, because the local authorities actually do have power to leave it and go elsewhere. And I think similarly, if you're going to win uh, this argument, what you're going to need is to talk about the limits of the localism. And the Localism Act, I think, is a great piece of legislation. I think it's truly transformative, but you need to talk about what it doesn't allow you to do. And I think you need to talk about the vision of the local authority that you want. And I remember, Colin, I think you, you came to us publicly and chatted to us. And actually, your conversation was the most politically effective articulation I've heard. Because you talked, and what, what Colin was saying, and you just had a little departmental chat, if you will, but they're often the best. I want to say is, can you imagine a situation where a local authority has a problem with teenage drinking with, because there's a culture of it, and I've lived in cities in the north, and it's can be quite extreme, and it drives people who aren't of that age group out. What if we were able to legislate, even for a short period of time in one area, no alcohol or alcohol pricing, or create the local conditions where people can make an immediate political difference to their locality, regardless of what anyone else was doing in another vicinity? And if if you can politically talk about and sketch and paint a vision in primary colours of the type of localism you, have, you could have, well, you could have different laws in different places. Now, what's interesting is for, for parties on the left, actually, this is the sort of localism they, they have to, they're slightly nervous about. Because the sort of localism they're slightly nervous about is the localism that can offer different services in different ways to different people. Because the standard claim of, of, of those of parties on the left, in order to deliver universal services, you have to deliver the same thing in the same way to everybody. If you don't, you have inequality. But the argument is surely that if we deliver the same thing in the same way to everybody, we, we actually get inequality. And actually, you need to pe treat people differently in order to achieve equity. Whereas if you treat people the same, you actually massively increase inequality. <coughs> So I think that, that, uh, that in order for this to win, there's two arguments that need to be made, one on the left and one on the right. And the one on the right is actually this won't be a, a rocket fuel for public expenditure, and what it will do is create what localism is, is needed. It will, it, one needs a positive reception of the Localism Act, but an understanding it won't deliver the vision that everybody wants. So we need a financial and a cultural account of what that localism could be like and, and what it could offer. And actually, just to add a third word, if you actually linked in with the growth agenda and said, actually, we can start micro-growth almost immediately, but centralised growth takes five years and it's already over. And again, look at our report on community bonds, because actually I think we've got part of the answer there for how, for how that can happen. On the left, I think, be careful of what you ask for. Because a really radical localism, I want local welfare. We're already getting it in some of the city deals. I want, all, I want local delivery of public services around social care, almost around anything I can imagine. Practical social care is such a crippling cost, and local authorities are not allowed to innovate. So they're faced with this crippling of cost and not allowed to innovate. But, but, but a left wing tradition, and rightly, in many ways, is very suspicious of localisation of services because it fears that you will lose universalisation and you will, and in some sense, some people will get less and others will get more. And that is an argument that needs to be thought through and one on the left as well. So if we're actually going to create what we want, and I agree both with what Graham said and with, uh, and with what other colleagues on, on the panel have talked about, these are they're the three battles that need to be fought. And just because I do politics, I would say they haven't yet even been engaged with it, let alone one. And that's where we need to take the debate next. Thank you.
Philip doesn't actually have to, to run the heater. <laughs> um, do you want to? I mean, do you want to respond? Yeah, I don't have to run. Sorry, I didn't um, mean. Um, <laughs> I have to smile at, um, at, at at the last contribution going around as a politician saying there'd be no drinking in this area, but with me. Yeah, yeah no, 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 no. It's uh, not a great manifesto to come back, but uh, I understand what it means by localism. I think finance, and it's a very complicated subject to articulate a vision, is obviously the key to everything we do. And that, obviously, if we, unless we get that right, whether it's an income tax, I've not been convinced yet of an answer that I've heard so far, although I like the tinkering around with different ideas. Um, because I, I don't think you can do away with some central control, uh, some central grant. Uh, release to you, uh, however much you want to generate your own income. I, th I suppose in very brief time, because people are obviously got to go, I'd say this, that the it is an interesting debate about finance, but it's not the only debate. We talked about who would be a member and who not, who would be a member now. Uh, I actually want young people to come in with hope and enthusiasm and vision. And I think that that's a part of our future challenge and job to persuade people that however minor it is now, it's still important that they come along and talk about the social dimension. The economic one, I think, has already been won. I'll give, again, a short example of what we can do in local government. And I've heard the argument to do a joint bank um, venture, as well as bonds, so that you can develop infrastructure. The biggest impact in the north we can have economically, in terms of investments and jobs, is to electrify the line from Manchester to Lis. It would cost uh, very little, it would create, it would create £7 billion and another 30,000 jobs. When you get examples of that, what is the biggest impact we can make to make our economies in the north grow? It's transport. Now, whether we get all the powers, whether we can take the responsibility to raise the money, again, is our responsibility if we want to take local government serious. So I get the economic argument. I think the whole city deal is about testing our ideas, our imagination, and our ambitions to do that. We've got to be given the powers and we'll test out on the city region. I think the other difficult one is, you know, everyone thinks uh, local government, when they pay council tax, uh, it's too much. So there's a very, I take your point, for the left, uh, is a big challenge about how we persuade people <coughs> that actually public services are worth paying for. The one thing that we don't talk about as much now, but we're beginning to. I'm, I've been local government for 42 years, unlike my two colleagues here, I was in the dirty job strike in 69, and I can tell you where I've got the power. It's as leader. It wasn't in 1969 as a manual worker. So it depends where you were, Colin, in terms of power. So I'm quite happy saying, I think if you're the right politicians and with the right group, with the right thing, we can turn things around. It's not just through officers, and I think that's our job to do it. But there is a one thing, Jane, I would say. One of the things that we never discuss, we talk structures, we talk finance, we don't talk values and we don't talk about public service ethos. And I think the days of marketisation of public services should be over with in terms of, I've heard the mantra years ago about it doesn't matter who runs it, people don't care. I do think there is something about a public service ethos which we need to keep, maintain, make it affordable, make it competitive, but actually keep it as a value in local government. And I think local government can live away with it. Just to, just to speak to that, um, I, we'd be delighted to work with you on that electrification proposal and make it direct into government. Mm -hmm. And it's precisely those sorts of fusions that can deliver the type of local, local, local growth um, that's needed. Yeah. Yeah. We'll we'll chat um, We've just got about five Sorry, minutes. that was sorry, just no, exciting. No, no, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's unusual in local government. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. We do just have time for a couple of questions. Uh, my name is Guy Dickinson, and I come from Dublin North. Uh, and I have no doubt that the only 
way to, to, to the question is how to, what is the meaning of independence to American government? The answer is control, complete control of one's finances and ability to spend them as one pleases. Um, now, hotel um, tax is not a good idea because all the taxes next borough they wouldn't have a hotel tax and you simply had a competitive advantage to your employment. I think uh, the local income tax is the only possible way of doing it. Um, there are two objection, main objections to that. First of all, they say it would be difficult in collecting it. Well, it wouldn't be any difficulty because the inland revenue would collect the local income tax at the same time as it collects the national income tax and then simply hand out it to the local authorities accordingly. So I think that's easy to do. What is more difficult is the idea that in some areas, or in many areas, the penny product uh, is very uh, small. Now, supposing the set of arguments you have, uh, this is the district councils, uh, halfway down, uh, they, you, can get a hundred, you can get one pound for your penny product. Uh, so you get a hundred pounds of your product. Uh, then, um, supposing uh, below that the line, people who get have less uh, than that, you get a certified uh, Now, my idea is that every, for every penny you raised, if you were below the line, uh, the government, the national exchequer, would make it up to 100 uh, to the median. So, you guarantee a minimum penny product. This seems to me would go very far towards um, rectifying inequalities and the different uh, back, backward uh, councils. Uh, I often got a chance to really improve themselves because they could have the same spending power as East the average uh, uh, council um, now. Thank, thank you very I'm just going to stop you there only because I'm conscious of time. I'm so sorry to I, cut I, you off in the middle of it. Thank you so much. There was a, another question just um, for the time. My name is Tom Richardson, head of an organisation called Eurokin. Uh, I just want to raise the question of statistics, especially the relationship between local government and the office of national statistics. We just had probably one of the most comprehensive census is of all time, mm -hmm. but um, I was speaking to a colleague in Birmingham actually just uh, an hour ago, something else. Mm -hmm. And the level of accuracy of that census in the private areas where migrants are living mm -hmm. is probably out by a third. Mm -hmm. There are all sorts of issues which I won't bore you into. So, in other words, there's a problem there of the army being out there, you know, in the whole statistical mm -hmm. and, and, and it, the ONS figures drive all local decisions. And so, the, so, 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 there's two questions here. Either you say, as, as someone said to me at another meeting, you just scrap the whole relationship with ONS and say it's gone, or whatever, which are all the political consequences of that, or you actually do other sorts of research and you can get more accurate things, or you do something else. It's like the importance they attach to it because you lose funding. Yes. But dramatically lose it, like Leeds has done because 50,000 now. So what, what do we do about it after, after we've just had a census? Well, like everyone else, we're, chall we're challenging the accuracy of it all. But I'll let well, them yeah, go. I, I, I mean, it's interesting in these debates how quickly we, we actually focus on finance above, yeah. above mm -hmm. everything else. And yeah. I think that's indicative of the problem that local government has. I'm not belittling your question in any way. Um, I think uh, there are two, two answers. One, one um, is to continue that fight with the Office of National Statistics to make sure that their research uh, takes into account the sorts of issues that, that you've raised, and indeed there are others as well uh, about the way in which populations are accounted and, 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 and the use of the census. Um, uh, the other is to say um, look, we, we go back to um, go back to the beginnings and really recast our system of local government and our system of local finance. Um, and as I often say, because I do work overseas with various kind of, um, uh, local government groups and. My view is if you're going to invent a system of local government, don't look at England because you know, I wouldn't recommend that as a, as, a way, as a way to go. We radically need to restructure the finances. The example um, uh, that, that I, I gave, and, and Graham often says, or said to me a couple of times, don't frighten the horses. So what I'm about to say is not associated with his code and with his, his particular campaign. But I think we do need to move to a system where local government has its own tax regime. Uh, and that it has a regime that is a mixture of different taxes that it wants to rise now uh, to raise. It also would not necessarily, I would argue, have to get um, uh, approval in referendums for the introduction of particular taxes. Right across the board, and if you look at the financial regime, the tax raising regime, local government across the globe, you just see a mix 
of different taxes within the same country. Some councils use, some don't. In, apparently, in, um, a colleague of mine was telling me, in Belgium, they can tax tax if they want to. They don't, because it's an upset in the, you know, upset in the cat owners. But the, the, principle, the principle is there. If you're able to be much more sophisticated in your finance raising regime, the questions of equalisation start to fade somewhat. Um, I absolutely think. So I also think the sort of work that you're describing between Manchester and Leeds in terms of electrification shouldn't require central government mm -hmm. involvement. Should require central government finance. It's the sort of thing we should just be expecting our councils to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you want to come in? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think one of the I was on a I went and gave a uh, a couple of lectures in Norway, and I was I was walking around, and I asked. You know, the question all of us always ask Scandinavians is how on earth do you make a high taxation system work? And he gave me an answer that I'd never heard before, and I actually think it's probably right. And he said, well, people support high taxation here because we're a very small people, and we're very alike, and we see the immediate impact of it. Now, what I think is also interesting, and then I had another conversation, and I then went to Denmark, and I was speaking to the Danish, and they were, they were talking about environmental taxes. They said, when you have an environment, Environmental tax just hitched onto your general tax, people hated it. But when you hypothecated it, and when you linked that tax to, to cars, people really supported it. Particularly when the benefits of that taxation were hypothecated as well. Now what I think this suggests is actually, and what we know from all the available evidence, is that once you have um, participatory budgets, support for taxation rises. And, and this is across, across the globe. So what I think is interesting is taxation innovation actually would, I know this would be shocking for an English bank, could possibly be popular. Because it would help people police very quickly the type of behaviour they don't want. And then if you hypothecate the resources in terms of the return and what you do with that, that can actually create a type of ecological financial system where people feel they can make a difference through taxation, then you change the whole debate. Interesting. Mm. Um, th of course, there are pockets of participatory budgets in this country, aren't there? Yeah. Have you got any here in Leeds? Uh, we did uh, have a couple, and they worked very well. Mm. And they brought out uh, community groups that probably wouldn't take part in mm. budget debates and discussions. So it is an interesting idea. Mm. It's only uh, very small scale. Yeah, yeah, I always think, though, um, looking at social attitudes, I get the car one, but if you say we want to hypothecate a certain amount of money to regenerate or address some of the benefit problems, you might have a different answer, unfortunately. But I, 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 get, I get the debate about innovation and income tax totally, and I do think, you know, I've been watching and studying local government finance since 1976, the Bill report, the Michael Lyons report. All governments have taken it on, and all governments have dropped it because it's a, a very difficult one to implement. But I do think what we've got now is totally unworkable and totally unacceptable. Mm -hmm. so we have to do it. Yeah. Uh, we also, ladies and gentlemen, have to finish. I'm terribly sorry. I know there are many, many questions that we could, and we could indeed take it further. But I'd like to thank all of our panelists, including Yasmin Gray.